Today on the podcast, we are talking about what truly saves us. At this time of year, we're constantly driven by our never-ending, ever-lengthening to-do list. But we're urged to pause and be reminded of the true purpose of all of our Christmas to-dos. We must behold the wonder of Christ's arrival and come adore Christ at Christmas. That's it. Join me today to talk about why this can reaffirm your faith and lead to a more worship-filled, grace-filled Christmas. Hey everyone, and welcome to season one, episode 18 of the More Beautiful Life Collective podcast. I'm Casey Fletcher, and I'm excited that you're joining me to create a life you love and cultivate your heart for God. If this is your first time listening to the show, don't forget to leave a rating and review wherever you listen to podcasts to help others find this show. Also, I wanted to let you know about a resource that I'm putting together for you that's linked in the show notes. It's called The Everlasting Joy of the Gospel an Advent study. In this study, we're going through the four different Advent candles, and we're talking about what they mean. This study is going to point you to the joy of the gospel by looking at the whole span of scripture in order to help you understand what Christmas symbolizes for us and how we can remember the gospel at Christmas time, which is so important. What we're going to be talking about today is focusing on how to behold and adore Christ at Christmas. Honestly, if I'm going to be truthful with you, I've been avoiding writing this podcast. It's halfway writer's block and then halfway pure procrastination because I look around and I see so many things to do with my to-do list getting ever longer as we tick the days one by one to Christmas. On top of the regular cleanup, so currently, if you look around my living room, I have toys strewn across the floor. I have two and a half ornaments that I have to glue back together because they constantly are being pulled off my tree and broken. Um, I have floors to mop, toilets to scrub for company that's coming to dinner. I have meals to prep. And in just a little while, our choir performance at church needs a dish made to share. And just sitting here, I could probably come up with 20 other things to do to get ready for what I have today, this week, and just the rest of the holidays. It's funny that at Christmas, we often find ourselves looking much more like Martha from the story of Mary and Martha in scripture than we look like Mary. We sing about coming to adore Christ. Oh, come, let us adore him. We sing and talk about beholding him. But often we're too busy with our to-do list to pause and even acknowledge Christ at Christmas. We definitely don't have time to adore him. Each night this week, I found myself creating two lists in my head as I hit the pillow after a long day. On one side, I think about all the things that I've done right. Did I read my Bible? Okay, yes five points for me. Did I eat a meal at home? Okay, perfect. 10 points to get that project done for the youth group. Okay, great job. 20 points. But then I start to think about all of the things that I do wrong. Did I forget to read my kids a Bible story for their school? Okay, minus 10 points. Did I stop and get a coffee on the way back from the grocery store when I said, okay, I'm not going to do this anymore? Okay, minus 15 points. Did I put on a movie to finish up that church project that needed to get done? So my kids ended up having more screen time than they should. Okay, minus 50 points because I just can't get things done without relying on screens. At the end of the day, I have this massive calculation done on a scale that I've made for myself. Are there things that I've done that measure up to my ideals? Did I get the cloth diapers washed? Did I look at social media? Did I clean the fridge? Are there things that I fall short on? Did I get outside enough today? Did we eat too much sugar? Is my pool still uncovered and it's December? Which the answer is yes. To be honest, I think I've made these calculations about my life for my whole life. If I did things right, then I could feel like that day was a good day and I was a good person because of it. I would just feel good that I was moving forward. But if I did things wrong, then I would feel like a failure. I would feel like I, my life was out of control and I would feel like I would never be good enough, that I could never measure up. So in my quest to feel good and to feel like a righteous person, I end up adding more and more to my plate, especially around the holiday season. Make a stocking for my daughter? Sure, why not? I can do that. Lead carols at the Christmas Eve service? I have to, right? Making my house look like a Hallmark movie? Well, that's, that's definitely tricky, but maybe I need to try because if I don't, I failed. But what I found is that we're never going to measure up to our ideals because life is real and messy and full of chaotic messy places and people. 
We dream about that picturesque Christmas, an idyllic marriage and family life, a picture-perfect life. But, you know, a picture-perfect life is just not real life. We all know that. And so, because our dream doesn't match our reality, we feel like failures. And honestly, sometimes whenever we have our dreams match up with our reality, we end up piling more on our plate because we feel like, oh yeah, I got this, so I can handle that. And we take on more and more and we end up becoming our own gods. And so whether we're feeling very accomplished and capable or feeling like we can't hold it, any, anything and everything together, we end up pursuing things that we, we shouldn't. And ultimately that leads to burnout we don't like feeling like we can't measure up to our ideals. And so most of the time we self-medicate it away, either by minimizing our dreams or by doing something to distract ourselves. So we say, ah, it's stupid to decorate your whole house at Christmas because what's it all for? We're just going to have to take it down (laughs) or the ornaments are just going to have to be glued back together, which is true. Or we do something else to distract ourselves. We watch Netflix shows and binge watch for the night, or we decide that we're going to go on Amazon and buy the latest thing because we just want to have something new in our lives. Or we pile on to our to-do list and we get depleted in a season of busyness that's trying so hard to make this dream a reality. All of this doing just sucks us dry. And why? I've thought about that a lot this season. Why? Because we're not focusing on what we truly need to do. Whenever we're doing all of this busyness, we're not doing what the true meaning of Christmas really is. And so what is the true meaning of Christmas? We hear about these things in shows, and a lot of times modern culture says the true meaning is, you know, family or love, and they leave it at that. But we know that the true meaning of Christmas is that it's the season that's all about beholding and adoring Christ. We have to stop the hustle and bustle of the season and, oh come, let us adore him. So every year we read the Christmas story at Christmas. It's a special time because of these traditions that we have, like I talked about in the last episode, but sometimes it can be a little bit repetitive. I'm nearing my 30s, so that's more than 30 times of reading the same story. And at some point, we may even find that we start to quote it ourselves. But the amazing thing about God's word is that we can read the same passage over and over and then be struck by something in a passage, a word, a phrase, a picture, a word picture that we've read, but we've never truly seen. As I was reading this year, I noticed the word behold over and over again throughout the Christmas story. Some versions, um, like I normally read out of the CSB, and some versions don't use this word, but then other versions like the ESV do. It's generally whenever you have an angel that came to deliver a word to one of the key players in our Christmas story. So thinking about like Zechariah, Mary, Joseph, shepherds. And so the word, it always makes me think of Linus in Charlie Brown and the Christmas story. As the lights dim and the spotlight is turned to his face, and he begins to quote the passage from Luke 2, and he starts with, and behold... There in the field was a flock of shepherds. And so it's just interesting because I hear that word and I know it's related to the Christmas story, but then it pops up so often and I have to think, okay, what's so special about this word? Beholding is a somewhat archaic way of saying, look, I'm going to show you something. And in that context, generally beholding is you're going to see something amazing, something full of wonder, something pretty impressive. You wouldn't say, look, if it was going to be a pile of dirty laundry. You're going to say, behold, if it's something magical. And so I think it's interesting that we get this admonishment over and over again from these messengers of God. They don't just say, be quiet and listen. (laughs) And, you know, if I'm trying to get a crowd to listen to me, I can think of my classroom whenever I had 30 kids that were talking and I wanted them to stop talking and listen to me. I didn't say, behold. Instead, I would say, be quiet, listen, sit down, look at me. And so I've said that over and over again whenever I want people to hear what I'm going to say. But the angels, they didn't do that. Instead, they're adamant that mankind needs to look and pay attention at what God is about to do. It wasn't the words that were coming out of their mouth. It was the fact that they were going to tell something that God was going to do in the future. That the things coming to pass that they were saying was going to come to pass. That was going to be a sign that God is doing something new. 
It's all about God's actions in that moment. And what they're saying is that God's actions at that moment are something to behold. They're a wonder. They're impressive. They're important. And at this moment, nothing was truly required from the hearers of the word other than to look and believe that God would do what he was said he was going to do, that a virgin would give birth, that they would find the baby wrapped and lying in a manger, that Elizabeth would become um, pregnant. All of these things, they point us to Christ at Christmas. Again, that God was going to do that, that he, what he said he was going to do and that they would see that come to pass that they would see the faithfulness of God. So they must behold. Beholding would lead to belief. It would lead to belief in God and belief in his son. God is telling them that he is going to do a new and wonderful thing. And in each case, each of these key players was able to behold God's work and they believed. Now, some of them, it took them a little bit of time. Zechariah did not believe at the beginning, but then as time went on, he did. Um, For others, they said, let it happen as you said. And so each one, they had a different story of what led to that belief. But at the end of the story, that's what happened. They believed. So what does beholding require of us? Well, one, it, it takes time to pause, take in and consider what is going to happen. It requires time to wonder at what is taking place. In each of these cases, the hearers turned and they looked at one another and they wondered to each other. They said, well, well, how can this be? They needed time to listen and be able to consider what was happening. And I think what's important is that time, it means that they can't be so busy that they don't process this. I think sometimes we are underrating the value of silence in our life and time where, you know, you don't have music or podcast or a movie playing in the background because you need time to wonder and treasure up things in your heart and just think about what God is doing. But if you constantly have noise in your life, you can't do that. And so in addition to this, beholding requires an open heart. I think in Zechariah, we find someone who does not react in a way that's acceptable and he's punished for that. He doubted the word of God. He demanded proof. And so it shows that he had a closed heart. He thought God was going to act in a certain way and God did it. And because he doubted him, God said, okay, I'm going to take away your, your ability to speak because you didn't believe in me. But through the months of silence he endured, he grew in faith. And so much so that he named his child John, which is what God told him, this is what you're going to name his child. Those were one of the first words that came out of his mouth is, yes, um, you know, I want his name to be John. I wrote that down. And then after that, the first words that came out of his mouth was a song of praise. He was praising God. And so I think with time and with an open heart, beholding leads to belief in God's wonderful works. It leads to belief in Christ at Christmas time. We often think about the birth of Jesus at Christmas when we retell the story over and over again. And importantly, I think Christmas is a moment to consider the gift of Jesus's life. It's a cliched phrase, but really that is a very deep truth that Jesus's life is a gift to us. It helps kind of fight against the entitlement that we might feel, self-righteousness that we might feel. Through Christmas, we see a fulfillment of the prophecies of God. So we see this faithfulness of God coming to pass. It's a waiting for hope that's realized in the purpose of Jesus. This fulfillment, it gives us hope in the future fulfillment of God's promises, the second coming of Jesus, the hope of the world being made right But I think it's important to say if if Jesus had only come and arrived in a manger, we wouldn't have the fulfillment of our hope. And if Jesus had only lived his life and done his ministry, we still wouldn't have a fulfillment of hope. He would have been a great prophet, but that would have been it. It's important that we look at Christmas as pointing through to Easter. It's not only a celebration of his birth, but also a reminder of his death on the cross, and the resurrection. Jesus' birth was a gift because of the sacrifice he made on the cross, the gift of his life. When we think about Christ at Christmas, we have to be reminded of this. We have to think about what saves you. As I think about my list, how I measure whether today has been a good day and 
consequently, whether I am a good person or not, how I'm measuring how good or righteous of a person I am based on how well I matched the ideals I've set for myself. I honestly am being just like those Pharisees of Israel that Jesus had come to save and he argued with throughout his life, but ultimately he was crucified by them. Because those Pharisees thought in terms not that much different from me. They measured their lives by how much they accomplished and how much they did. And that ultimately was just how self-righteous they were. And because of this, that's why Jesus was such a threat to them that he was crucified by them because they didn't want this message of somebody who said, it's not what you do that saves you, but it's belief in me. For them, that took the power away from them. Jesus knew that their self-righteousness would not truly save them. And because of that, they rejected Jesus. Nothing that they did would save them at that point because they didn't believe in Jesus. So no amount of works would save them because they had rejected Jesus who would save them. We are only saved through justification in Christ Jesus. Through Jesus's work on the cross, as our sacrifice and high priest, he perfectly fulfills the debt that we have. No amount of our work can add or take away from that. This is the gospel. This is the good news that spread like wildfire in the early church, that we can be saved and then be made perfect through the work of God by his son in the spirit. This gospel, it's not news to me today, even though it is good news. But sometimes I find myself needing to hear it again because a different type of gospel pervades our culture. I was listening to a podcast and he said this, and I think it's definitely true. It says, uh, we hear frequently of this response to the question, you know, if somebody says, what's going to happen when you die? And somebody says, "Eh, well, I hope I've done enough to get into heaven. It's this thing of like, well, my works are the things that save me. They say, well, I'm a good enough person that I could do this, even if they're kind of agnostic on whether heaven or hell even exists. I think it's that gospel of works that emphasizes our actions or our own self-righteousness. I do this myself, you know, as I measure myself against what I need to accomplish that day to be a good person, you know, in air quotes, I'm measuring myself saying, okay, well, if I've done this, if I've matched my ideals, then I am a good person. But if I don't, then I'm not. And so I think whenever you feel that way, you are believing in a different gospel other than the one that Jesus came to give us. That good news that he is the one that truly saves. John Calvin said that the heart and mind of man is a perpetual forge of idols. I've heard it said that, you know, the paraphrase of this is that we are an idol factory. Yes, our idols may come in the form of influencers and likes on social media, or it could be billion dollar grossing pop stars and their romance with NFL players, or it could even be men in furry red caps and suits proclaiming about the magic of Christmas, that you just need to believe in Santa Claus and it's okay. But I think just as often our idols come from our ideals. We've created ourselves a standard or a law that we must reach, that if we fall short, we're condemned. And again, these ideals are things like I mentioned. Did I cloth diaper today? Did I make a meal at home today? Did I, uh, maybe it's something to do with your friend group that you guys have all established an ideal that you're going to do this and this is the law you have to set for yourselves. But we think by doing these things, that we are saving ourselves. Even if you are not a Christian and you believe in some of, you know, the ideology of today where you have to say X, Y, and Z to be politically correct, that is also an ideology where you feel like if you are not being that politically correct, you get canceled or you get condemned. And so you feel like you are not saved because you're not adhering to these laws that are set in place. You've created a new law for yourself. So in doing all of this, whenever we create these idols that we can never really match up to, never really uh, meet, we have condemned ourselves. Jesus doesn't condemn us in the situation. Jesus has come to save us from this perpetual forge of idols to give us this better way, this good news, this gospel that he saves us, not our works. We behold the great message of Jesus, this new thing, this new covenant, that we can enter into through what Jesus has done through his life, death, and resurrection. We can relate to God differently now. 
Our self-proclaimed righteousness doesn't have to be this heavy weight, this heavy yoke on our shoulders anymore. When we come and behold him, we come and behold the truth of the gospel. So what does this lead to? Beholding, like I said before, is always tied up and it ends in praise. As Zechariah, Mary, and Elizabeth, and all the angels saw this new and wondrous thing, they couldn't help but praising God. When we recognize now all that we have received in Christ at Christmas, we can't help but praise God ourselves. Beholding is tied to adoring. So when we stop the hectic movement of Martha and we come and sit at Jesus' feet, We pause and we look up at our Savior, and we remember him as a tiny baby, and then as a great teacher, and then as a broken sacrifice on the cross. And we also remember and look forward to Christ the King triumphant, the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end that will return. We adore him as holy, 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 forever and ever. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus, come. How can you adore Christ at Christmas? Yes, your to-dos will always be there. And it's important. We talked about why traditions are important. Go make those Christmas cookies. You're creating memories and you are reminding your children of the story of Christmas at this time. But I also want you to pause this Christmas and create space in your schedule to dwell with them, to open up your Bible and pray, to open up your heart and worship him, to sing carols and think about what it means to truly worship in that moment, to learn about the symbolism of Christmas And also wonder at the truths that are nestled within the decorations, the legends, the stories. To worship together with your family and friends over good meals and together in worship services and cantatas and kids Christmas programs. To magnify Christ as you consider the common grace that's extended to all of us. Christmas is not about the doing. The Christian walk is never about the doing. It's always about the beholding and adoring, which leads to becoming more sanctified in Christ. Let's pray. Lord, we love you for the sacrifice that you gave us for the birth of your son, for the life of Jesus, for the hope that we have in Christ at Christmas, for the gift that started the original Christmas. Help us to behold this new thing you are doing with Jesus. This wondrous thing, we adore you. We worship you for all you've done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. I hope this episode has encouraged you amid the hustle and bustle of the season. If it has, leave a comment or shoot me an email and let me know. Also, don't forget to leave a rating and review wherever you listen to podcasts. This will help others find the show. You can find the show notes at the link below this episode. And you can also download the Everlasting Joy of the Gospel Advent Study Guide. I'm Casey Fletcher. And until next time, keep creating a life you love and cultivating your heart for God.